As a form of rational intervention wielding political power over men, the role of the police is to supply them with a little extra life and, by doing, supply the state with a little extra strength. This is done by controlling communication, that is, common activities of individuals, such as work, production, exchange, and accommodation. But you will object, but that's only the utopia of some obscure author. You can hardly deduce any significant consequences from it. But I say... Tokay's book is but one example of a huge literature circulating in most European countries of the present day. The fact is that it is oversimple and yet very detailed, brings out all the better the characteristics that could be recognized elsewhere. Above all, I'd say that such ideas were not stillborn. They spread all through the 17th and 18th centuries, either as applied policies such as cameralism or mercantilism, or as subjects to be taught, the German uh, Pole Zeisweissenschaft. Let us not forget that this was the title under which the science of administration was taught in Germany. These are the two perspectives that I would like not to study, but at least to suggest. First, I will refer to a French administrative compendium, then to a German textbooks. First, every historian knows in De Lemaire's compendium, Treaty on the Police. At the beginning of the 18th century, this administrator undertook the comp compilation of the whole kingdom's police regulations. It is an infinite source of very valuable information, the general conception of the police that such a quantity of rules and regulations could convey to an administrator like de Lamar is what I'd like to emphasize. De Lamar says that the police must see to 11 things within the state. First, religion. Second, morals. Third, health. Fourth, supplies. Fifth, roads highways, towns, buildings, six, public safety, seven, the liberal arts, roughly speaking, though, arts and science, eight, trade, ninth, factories, tenth, manservants and laborers, and eleven, the poor. The same classification features in every treatise concerning the police, as in Turkey's utopia program, apart from the army, just as properly speaking, and direct taxes, the police apparently sees to everything. The same thing can be said differently. Royal power had asserted itself against feudalism, thanks to the support of an armed force and by developing a judicial system and establishing a tax system. These were the ways in which royal power was traditionally wielded. Now, the police is the term covering the whole new field in which centralized political and administrative power can intervene. Now, what is the logic behind intervention in cultural rights? Small-scale production techniques, intellectual life, and the road network. De Lamar's answer seems a bit hesitant. Here he says the police sees to everything pertaining to men's happiness. There he says the police sees to everything regulating society or social relations carried on between men. Elsewhere he says that the police sees to living. This is the definition I will dwell upon. It is the most original and it clarifies the other two. And De Lamar himself dwells upon it. He makes the following remarks as to the police's 11 objects. The police deal with religion, not of course from the viewpoint of dogmatic truth, but from that of the moral quality of life. In seeing to health and supplies, it deals with the preservation of life concerning trade, factories, workers, the poor, and public order. It deals with the conveniences of life. In seeing to the theater, literature, entertainment, its object is life's pleasures. In short, life is the object of the police. The indispensable, the useful, and the superfluous. That people survive, live, and even do better than just that, this is what the police has to ensure. And so we link up with the other definitions that Lamar proposes. The sole purpose of the police is to lead man to the utmost happiness to be enjoyed in this life. Where again, the police cares for the good of the soul, thanks to religion and morality, the good of the body, food, health, clothing, and housing, wealth, such as industry, trade, and labor. Or, again, the police sees to the benefits that can be derived only from living in a society that is upheld, that keeps the criminals off the streets. Now, second, let us now have a look at the German textbooks. They were used to teach the science of administration somewhat later on. It was taught in various universities, especially at Göttingen University, and this was extremely important for continental Europe. Here it was the Prussian, Austrian, and Russian civil servants, those who were to carry out Joseph II's and Catherine the Great's reforms in Russia, were trained. Certain Frenchmen, especially in Napoleon's entourage, knew the teachings of Polis Weissenschaft very well. What was to be found in these textbooks? 
Uh, Huhenthal's Liber de Politica featured the following items, the number of civilians, religion and morals, health, food, the safety of persons and of goods, particularly in reference to fires and floods, uh, the administration of justice, citizens' conveniences and pleasures, and how to obtain them, how to restrict them. Uh, then comes a series of chapters about rivers, forests, mines, brine pits, housing, and finally several chapters on how to acquire goods, either through farming industry or trade. In his Precis for the Police, J.P. Wildebrand speaks successfully of morals, trades, and crafts, health, safety, and uh, at last of all, town building and planning. Considering the subjects at least, there is not a great deal of difference from de la Mars. But the most important of these texts is Johann Heinrich Gottlob's jo uh, von Justi's Elements of Police. The police and their specific purpose is still defined as live individuals in society. Uh, nevertheless, the way von Justi organizes his book is somewhat different. He studies first what he calls the state's landed property, that is, its territory. He considers it in two different aspects, how it is inhabited, town versus country, and then who inhabit these territories, the number of people, their growth, health, morality, immigration. Uh, von Justi then analyzes the goods and chattels, that is, the commodities, manufactured goods, and their circulation, which involve problems pertaining to cost, credit, and currency. Finally, the last part is devoted to the conduct of individuals, their morals, their occupational capabilities, their honesty, and how they respect the law. In my opinion, Von Justi's work is a much more advanced demonstration of how the police problem evolved than de Lamar's introduction to his compendium of statutes. There are four reasons for this. First, John Von Justi defines much more clearly what the central paradox of police is. The police, he says, is what enables the state to increase its power and exert its strength to the fullest or satisfactory. On the other hand, the police has to keep the citizens happy, happiness being understood as survival, life, and improved living. He perfectly defines what I feel to be the aim of the modern art of government, or state rationality, namely to develop those elements constitutive of individuals' lives in such a way that their development also fosters the strength of the state. Von Justi then draws a distinction between this task, which he calls police, as do his contemporaries, and politic, die politic. Die politic is basically a negative task. It consists in the state's fighting against its internal and external enemies. Police, however, is a positive task. It has to foster both citizens' lives and the state's strength. And here is the important point. Von Justi insists much more than does de Lamar on a notion that became increasingly important during the 18th century, that of population. Population or population density was understood as a group of live individuals. Their characteristics were those of all the individuals belonging to the same species living side by side, and thus they presented morality and fecundity rates. They were subject to epidemics over population. They presented a certain type of territorial distribution. True, de Lamar said, and did use the term life to characterize the concern of the police, but the emphasis he gave it wasn't very pronounced. Proceeding through the 18th century, and especially in Germany, we see that what is defined as the object of the police is population. That is, a population density or a group of beings living in a given area. And last, one has only to read von Justi to see that it is not only a utopia, as with Tokay, or a compendium of systematically filled regu filed regulations. Von Justi claims to draw up a Pole Zeiweissenschaft. His book is not simply a list of prescriptions, it is also a grid through which the state, that is, territory, resources, population, towns, and so on, can be observed. Von Justi combines statistics, the description of states, with the art of government. Poliv Zeiweissenschaft is at once an art of government and a method for the analysis of a population living on a territory. Such historical considerations must appear to be very remote. They must seem useless in regard to present-day concerns. I wouldn't go as far as Hermann Hesse, who says that only the constant reference to history, the past and antiquity, is uh, fecund. But experience has taught me that the history of various forms of rationality is sometimes more effective in unsettling 
are certitudes and dogmatism than in abstract criticism. For centuries, religion could not bear having its history told. Today, our schools of rationality balk at having their history written, which is no doubt significant. What I have wanted to show is a direction for research. These are only the rudiments of something I've been working at for the last two years. It is the historical analysis of what we would call, using an obsolete term, the art of government. This study rests upon several basic assumptions. I'd sum up these assumptions like this. First, power is not a substance, neither is it a mysterious property whose origin must be delved into. Power is only a certain type of relation between individuals. Such relations are specific, that is, they have nothing to do with exchange, production, communication, or even though they combine with them. The characteristic feature of power is that some men can more or less entirely determine other men's conduct, but never exhaustively or coercively. A man who is chained up and beaten is subject to force being exerted over him, not power. But if he can be induced to speak when his ultimate recourse could have been to hold his tongue, preferring death, then he has been caused to behave in a certain way. His freedom has been subjected to power. He has been submitted to government. If an individual can remain free, however little his freedom might be, power can subject him to government. There is no power without potential refusal or revolt. Second, as for all relations among men, the many factors determine power. Yet rationalization is also constantly working away. There are specific forms to such rationalization. It differs from the rationalization particular to economic processes or to the production and communication techniques. It differs from that of scientific discourse. The government of men by men, whether they form small or large groups, whether it is power exerted by men over women or by adults over children, or by one class over another, or by a bureaucracy over a population, or it is a certain ethnicity over another, involves a certain type of rationality. It does not involve instrumental violence. And third, consequently, those who resist or rebel against a form of power cannot merely be content to denounce violence or criticize an institution, nor is it enough to cast the blame on reason in general. What has to be questioned is the form of rationality at stake. The criticism of power wielded over the mentally sick or mad cannot be restricted to psychiatric institutions, nor can those questioning the power to punish or be content with denouncing prisons as total institutions. The question is, how are such relations of power rationalized? Asking, is it the only way to avoid other institutions with the same objectives and the same effects from taking their stead? And fourth, for several centuries, the state has been one of the most remarkable, one of the most redoubtable forms of human government. Very significantly, political criticism has reproached the state with being simultaneously a factor for individualization and a totalitarian principle. Just to look at nascent state rationality, just to see what its first policing project was, makes it clear that right from the start, the state is both individualizing and totalitarian. Opposing the individual and his interest to it is just as hazardous as opposing it with the community and its requirements. Political rationality has grown and imposed itself all throughout the history of Western societies. It first took its stand on the idea of pastoral power, then on that of reason of state. Its inevitable effects are both individualization and totalization. Liberation can come only from attacking not just one of these two effects, but political rationality's very roots.